Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bill Miller. I'll be your instructor for Chemistry 401. Uh, it's very nice to see so many familiar faces from last semester. I'm excited for new people as well. Um, in about five minutes, I'm going to get started lecturing. Uh, that's why you have this handout. And so if you do not have this handout, please come up and get it. Syllabus. Uh, this is Chemistry 401. I'm sure you can read all of the intricacies of this class. Uh, short answer. Come on up, Hannah. Pick these up, please. Um, the, this is a big class. It is at least as big as Chem 400. Um, some people would say bigger, some people would say the same, uh, at least the ones I've talked to. So you should plan on spending a lot of time to do well in this class. It is very math-based. Uh, things that you will need for next week. Next week, in your four-hour lab portion, you need a lab notebook. You, um, and if you have any questions, I can answer them after class. You need to have all of these things in it. And so uh, those of you who I saw this morning, at 8 a.m. on Monday, we will start doing lab. Um, and then for those of you who I have not seen yet until now, who have the afternoon lab sections, so we will meet from 2 to 4.05-ish for discussion period, and then you will have lab on uh, today. Uh, well, you'll have lab period today, but lab one won't be done until next week. So you'll need your lab notebooks next week. For those of you who have uh, the four-hour lab session today at 2 p.m., uh, Professor Wesley Segru will be leading that, and you should head on over there after this lecture. Uh, any, um, let's see, what else? Oh, green sheet homework. This is graded. It is 10 points. It is not due for at least two Wednesdays. I believe it will be two Wednesdays from now that it is due, and we'll talk more about that in discussion. But you should pick this up, and you will start to be able to answer these questions uh, as soon as uh, 10 minutes from now, after class. If you need an ad number um, for the afternoon lab section, we do have them. Um, and so see Professor Segru. And uh, any questions before we get started? Marissa? Would you happen to know if So uh, Professor Segru and I have talked and we'll be on the same page as far as lab notebooks. So uh, yes, um, I would say the one thing, the one question that's come up is um, he will be grading the labs for the afternoon lab, uh, although I'm happy to answer questions about that. Any other questions? If not, then we're going to jump into material. For those of you who are new, you should know that I use three colors um, max, and that you might want to take notes with three colors as well. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, uh, I'm going to. Did you just come in? Please grab this uh, handout, or I'll bring it over to you. Thank you. I like to write on the board. I like to pair that with PowerPoints. And uh, this semester, I'm going to try and do both at the same time. So um, one thing that's different about this first lecture, though, and uh, the subject is kinetics. Kinetics means rate of change with time for reactions. And we're actually going to show some videos first. Um, the other thing I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and alternate the slides here so I can keep one slide up while I'm writing on the next one and reference it as we go. It's an experiment. I love experiments. We'll see how it goes. I would be more than happy to have your feedback after class or at some point about how it's going. Um, chapter 14, kinetics. Uh, oh, the one more thing I'll say before I lecture. I strongly urge you to read about kinetics in the book. It is a difficult topic. We will cover it in lecture, but it, you are best, in particular, I would say that's true for all of the chapters, but in particular, kinetics. Some reactions occur quickly. Uh, the second slide will be some reactions occur uh, or go slowly. I have videos. Let's see if I can make this work. Do you hear those? Pew, pew. 
those are pieces of debris shooting by the, ca the, the camera at very high speeds. That was a fast reaction, that was an explosion. See all these moles of gas? That are, those are expanding and moving those rocks by you. That was a fast reaction. Here's a slow reaction. It is rusting of iron. And even this is not that slow reaction, but it is showing here, day 24, 5, certainly a much slower reaction than the other one. Try and see what I have to say about this. A couple notes about this. First of all, what is kinetics? Kinetics is the area of, consent of chemistry concerned with reaction rates. Rxn, that is my abbreviation for the word reaction, the area of chemistry concerned with reaction rates. Rate laws and reaction mechanisms. And reaction mechanisms. And what you'll see through my lecture is we'll, uh, this will be a very data-driven chapter. As we go, we'll start about calculating reaction rates, then evolve into the other topics. Uh, now, uh, as far as reactions go on the second slide here, the rusting of iron, that took 30, you know, five to 10 to 30 days to occur in this example. There's uh, another slow reaction. And that is a reaction that turns carbon in its diamond form into carbon in its graphite form. That is a reaction that is occurring. If you have a diamond right now in approximately 10 to 100 billion years, it will be graphite. So that is an extremely slow reaction. Ten to a hundred billion years to occur. That is very slow. Let's see how this works. There we go. That should be our next slide. Like I said, we're going to start with the rate of a chemical reaction. Uh, first, we'll start with the rate of travel. That's a velocity. Velocity or speed is something that we talked about uh, last semester. So velocity is a change of position for time. And now we might write that is delta x over delta t. That's my lowercase or uppercase Greek letter delta. It's a triangle. Now let's get back to chemistry. Second, some data for the reaction with uh, peroxide, uh, hydrogen peroxide going to water and oxygen gas. Here's what the data looks like for concentration of peroxide versus time in seconds. And what I'm asking us to calculate, or what we're going to calculate, is the average rate of disappearance of hydrogen peroxide. Um, I don't know why the bottoms of those twos are not appearing. Between 0 and 400 seconds. Now, the first thing I'd like to say is it is a rate of disappearance. And that is because it is a reactant. Reactants react away. There is less of them over time. It is disappearing. 
Now, um, how I'm going to note this, and I think you have a little more space, so I'm going to actually start out here. It's going to be a change in concentration of something. This something is hydrogen peroxide divided by a change in time. And that's going to be specifically for 0 to 400 seconds. So, and this is going to be a little fraction here that takes this whole space. So the concentration of hydrogen peroxide at 400 seconds. Minus the concentration of hydrogen peroxide at 0 seconds. over the change in time for those. And so uh, that's very simply how we're going to do this. We're going to look at these two points. If you've had me before, you know I love graphs. I love graphing things. My one problem with this graph, it's not a straight line. Don't worry, it will be soon. Now, uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to read these. And when you read a graph, you can expect to do a lot of this in the kinetics chapter read it correctly, but there's some error there, so I don't expect you to read it exactly like I would. So uh, 400 seconds, all right, so that's 400 seconds, that's that dot. I see, well, I don't know what your page looks like, but uh, one point, and I read it already. I get about 1.72, but if you get 1.71 or 1.73, or even a little farther than that, that's fine. That is a molarity. I do love units. And then up here, uh, 2.123, 2.32. Filling in the whole thing there, 400 uh, minus 0. And then calculating that out, I get. Uh, well, this is a negative number divided by a positive number, so uh, we will get a negative answer. It is minus 0 0.0015, that's the number. The units are going to be molarity per second, like so. And you can put that in scientific notation, that's fine. Uh, I guess technically there should be another zero there because in my lectures, pretty much everything has three sig figs. That's the same as last semester. And my calculator didn't have that zero, so that's why it wasn't there. Value structure. Now this is molarity uh, per second, another way of writing that. Molarity, seconds to the minus one. You'll see a lot of that this semester, a lot more than last semester. That means the same thing. Any questions about this? Pretty much, we just did the slope of this line as well. That's exactly what we're doing. And the slope of concentration versus time will be the rate of reaction. Question? Yeah. So is there a rate of if it's a rate of disappearance, it will always be negative. Exactly. Good question. Any other questions? All right. Let's see if we can keep this rodeo going. There we go. We can do more of this. We can do the average rate of appearance between uh, uh, for, of oxygen between 0 and 400 seconds. Oxygen, of course, being a product here. And... But we don't have data for oxygen. All we have is the data for peroxide. Let me ask you this question. As peroxide disappears, what's the ratio of oxygen that will appear? Can you use the coefficients? You can, and that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to start with this number down here. And 
know I have a complex set of units for that number. We'll set it up like that. Molarity, that's molarity. What does molarity stand for? What over what? Moles per liter. So what we're saying there is uh, zero point, or negative 0 0.0015 moles per liter of hydrogen peroxide. So when I do my conversion next, I have moles of hydrogen peroxide on the top. Well, I'm actually going to change that to a 2. The 2 being the coefficient right here. For every two moles of hydrogen peroxide <coughs> reacted, there is one mole of oxygen produced. Those are just the coefficients. It's a little more complicated than Chem 400 because I can't very clearly see what's going on here, but of course we're going to. Now, for those who have had me before, you know I love signs as well as units. And to make the signs work here, this reacted thing means it's going away. So you can put a minus in there as well. Because the rate of appearance should be positive. And however you make that happen is fine with me. This works very well in my mind. But as long as your rates of disappearance are negative and your rates of appearance are positive. So in the end, divide that by 2, you get a positive number. The number I get is 0 0.00075, that's molarity. <coughs> per second or seconds to the minus 1. And at some point I should probably convert this uh, well, I should keep that third digit there, 750, but at some point maybe scientific notation would be appropriate. Questions about this? Okay. Then uh, let's do the average rate of appearance of oxygen between 1600 and 2000 seconds. Still using the same data. So far in my system, I'm very happy with it. The data is right here. Now you're using 1,600 to 2,000. These two points, and again, you're taking the slope. And the first thing I would like to say, or the first thing I'd like to ask is, as far as the rate of either disappearance or appearance, just based on the slope, will this be larger or smaller? The slope here compared to the slope here? Smaller, so our numbers will be smaller. I'm big on answers that make physical sense. And especially if you can look at this graph and understand that what we're calculating are the slopes, we know the slope should be smaller. Our process for this is going to be to do the same two steps over again. This time I read, well, I'm going to do my denominator first. I do that because now I know that the number that has to go up here is associated with the 2,000 seconds point, and otherwise sometimes I get mixed up. The other thing, as far as physical reality, you know this is a reactant, so you know that the rate of disappearance, that's what we're starting with, we'll get to rate of appearance in a minute, we know that the rate of disappearance has to be negative as well, or we don't know it yet, but we will. All right. Um, I get 0 0.52 and 0 0.71 for those two times. I get negative 0 0.000475 molarity of peroxide per second by doing this math here. That is my rate of disappearance. Basically do the same thing again down here. Take my rate of disappearance.
Down here, I've omitted the reacted and produced and just left behind the minus sign. And I get 0 0.000238 molarity of oxygen. Now, it's early, it's the first lecture, but I want to get this out there uh, for those who are new. The more you see something in my class, in general, the more you should expect to see it on an exam. You've seen this twice. I mean, it's, and it factors into a lot of problems. You'll see it on the homework. You'll see it in the discussion. I would not be surprised at all if you're asked to read a graph and determine and calculate some sort of rate. And we have a lot of calculations to go, but keep that in mind as you go through this. The more you see something, the, the, like, I mean, sort of how I make my examples, I'm like, oh, what did we do a lot of? Well, let's put it on the exam. More or less, you can't expect to see everything on the exam. And again, for those of you who are new, and uh, hopefully this is your experience, uh, former students, um, but I see taking this class as since most people are not chemists, you know what grade you want, and you want to work to get there. And I also am very practical about, okay, if you, you know, be efficient, study, learn the material, take, take whatever, like, if you don't like my process, do your own, that's fine. I will always mark you correct if you get the correct answer, as long as I can see your process, more or less. I don't have to see it all, either, but at least something that allows me to follow. Any questions about what I've got up here? All right. Ah, there we go. Now, what we're going to define as the rate of reaction is not dependent upon whether it is a reactant or a product, or what the coefficient is. So we've been doing rates of disappearance and rates of appearance, but where we're going is to a definition of rate of reaction <coughs> that is independent of the values. Is it working if I write over here? Does it fit on your page? Mm -hmm. well, I write big. So uh, rate of reaction or reaction rate, those terms are used interchangeably, is a positive quantity that depends on time but not chemical species. And chemical species or species is a word that I will use quite frequently this semester. It just means reactant or product or whatever chemical thing we're talking about. But not chemical species nor coefficient. And that's my abbreviation for coefficient. And now I'm going to start talking about different kinds of reaction rates. And the first one I'm going to talk about is sort of what we've been doing already. It's called the average reaction rate. And the average reaction rate is going to be defined as minus 1 over the coefficient times the average rate of disappearance. redundant because only reactants have rates of disappearance. Or no minus sign here, by the way, just one over <coughs> coefficient, average rate of appearance. Of 
problems. And so these examples will refer to the hydrogen peroxide and the oxygen from the previous example. Sorry, right, from previous example. It's going to be minus 1 over 2 times the change in concentration. of hydrogen peroxide divided by change in time. And this is just reviewing what we did already. It's also going to be equal to minus, uh, or sorry, plus just 1 over 1 times change in concentration. of oxygen over change in time. And so taking the coefficients, putting them in the denominator like that, and having the definition be a minus here, means that if you use these definitions, you will always get the same thing, whether you look at data that are related to a reactant or data that are, is related to a product. Any questions about that? Yes, Logan. Say that again, please. Do you end up with a unit for the rate of reaction that you get? Do you end up with a set of units for the rate of reaction? Correct. Yes. You can see, uh, so the things that we're doing here do not affect the units. So, so far, the units of reaction rate are always molarity per second. We will see other sets of units, but they'll all be similar. For gas phases, sometimes you'll see like milliliters of gas per second. We'll see other time units depending upon how fast reaction is. Could be seconds, minutes, hours, years. But they always have some sort of units that talks about the rate, that the, the amount of stuff is changing in the top and the time in the bottom. So is it usually measured as like the amount of a product produced over time? So the average rate of the reaction? Well, what'll happen is when we get to rate of reaction, we're actually going to take away what it is. It'll just be molarity per second. Maybe, yeah, maybe that gets it. Uh, but perhaps you've noticed already, but I do encourage questions in lecture. The class, the reason, one of the reasons we start lecturing in the first five minutes and we get off to a relatively fast start is so that we do have time for at least some, and oftentimes many, questions. Now what we covered here is the average reaction rate. Now what I want to define is the instantaneous rate and the initial rate. Uh, so average rate versus instantaneous rate. We've got the same data over here, but I'm going to redraw a little sketch here. Of just concentration of A versus time. And so they all look like that. A is just some random reactant. Um, and what I want to differentiate and what I want to use this line instead of the dots for is if you want an instantaneous rate, what you need to do is you need to draw a tangent line. And I will try and draw a tangent line, but you know what I'm doing, so do your own. At some point, And so that's my tangent line. I'm going to write above this up here. Instantaneous rate at one time. And that's different than our average rates, which is what we've been doing so far, 
average rate over from 0 to 400 seconds, say, or 1,600 to 2,000 seconds. So an instantaneous rate is at one time. And now let's talk about the initial rate. The initial rate is the instantaneous rate at time equals 0. Initial rate is instantaneous rate at time equals zero. Initial, if you will. Doesn't get any earlier, earlier than time equals zero, okay? And I still have a little work to do up here, but first, before I work up here, let me tell you why do we care about the, and this is my first typo, why do we care about the initial rate? That's what I'm gonna answer right here. Why do we care about the initial rate? Well, as we will hear throughout Chemistry 401, reactions go both ways. Meaning they can go from reactants to products, and we will see that they can go from products back to reactants. Okay? That's the theme. We saw a little bit of that in Chem 400 when we looked at phase changes going from solid to liquid and liquid back to solid. But if it's initially, there are no products, the reaction cannot go from products to reactants. So we focus on initial rates because the reaction initially can only go forward. And I'll write that, something like that too. Why do we care about the initial rate? Because at time equals zero, initially, the reaction only goes in the forward direction. Therefore, we are studying the kinetics of only the forward reaction. Therefore, we are studying the kinetics of only the forward reaction. And we're chemists, right? Well, today we are, this semester we are. We want to define the problem well and then study it. And this is part of that process. Any questions about that? Yeah. Can you explain the unique kinetics? Yes. Kinetics, I defined it as the study of reaction rates, reaction uh, uh, rate laws, basically how fast do reactions go. And so, let's see, therefore we're studying the kinetics. So basically what I'm trying to say here is, if we want to understand how fast a reaction goes, we want it to be the only reaction happening. And then, like, yeah, I don't know, does that answer your question? Uh, ah, companion problem. <coughs> companion problems are something I do, uh, so I will post the answers to the companion problems, especially if you don't see them, please email me, and I, that sort of kickstarts me sometimes. <laughs> this is a companion problem. Uh, let's see. For the reaction, uh, so a different set of data, a different problem, the initial rate, the average rate. I do want to say a couple things about this companion problem, and then I will post the answer, but I won't do it in lecture. How do we calculate the initial rate 
in reality because we can't really draw a tangent line at t equals zero. And so the easiest thing to do is, no, it's still not that easy. Let me do that again. I actually just connected the first two points. And so we will assume that the initial rate is the average rate for the first two points. It's not a perfect assumption, but I don't know what other thing we can do. Meaning, I don't know how to draw a tangent that would be better here. Huh, anybody taking Bio 402 this semester? Uh, at Sac City College? I don't imagine, so. Uh, you, they may tell you how to draw a better tangent line, but then come back and discuss with me. I don't know, so, this is, speaking of tangents, um, when, I first, when I first came to City College, back in, uh, started teaching Chem 401 back in fall 2000, um, a lot of students take Chem 401 and Bio 402 at the same time, and so I got to know a lot about the labs, and I don't know if the labs are still the same, I imagine many of them are. And this was a great lab, by the way. I totally hope you guys do this. Um, but, but we do, as chemists and biologists, sometimes have slightly different methods. I will say that. Anyway, we can talk about it. So anyway, so just want to uh, put this in here. The initial rate will be assumed to be equal to the average rate of the first two points. will be assumed to be equal to the average rate between the first two points. We talk a lot about things that are between other things this semester, so I will define an abbreviation B slash W for between. If you ever see an abbreviation I'm using that you don't know, please ask. The average rate between first two points. Anyway, so practically speaking, that's how we determine the initial rate. Uh, although I'm open to other, I am open to other, better ways of doing it. Any questions about that? Hey. Ah, what are you doing? You are solving for the rate of reaction, which means you have to calculate the average rate of disappearance, it'll be negative. You add a negative sign and then divide it by two to get the rate of reaction. So a couple steps. Does that answer your question though? So it's not disappearance, it's not appearance. It's uh, last slide we did, we said, oh, okay. yeah, it's a new. Give it a shot and you'll see it in, in the notes. That I have All right. More videos. Uh, so many things happen with respect to time in the kinetics chapter. I think we have almost 100% of the videos in the entire class in this chapter. These are not as explosive, though. Uh, oh. I think it says it. Coils of magnesium metal ribbon are added to two test tubes. The test tube on the left contains six molar hydrochloric acid. The test tube on the right contains 0.3 molar hydrochloric acid. They both react forming hydrogen gas. Visual evidence that higher concentrations have faster reaction rates. Did the video stop or is it still going? I think it stopped, yeah. Because what I want to emphasize here too is that both reactions will get to the same place given limiting reactants or given that we have enough material in here 
But you can see that, uh, did it tell you what it was in here? It was a magnesium ribbon, and it's completely gone here. And this is a CAMP 400 problem where we ask you, which is the limiting reactant? And you say magnesium in this case. If magnesium is the limiting reactant here, the entire magnesium ribbon will still go away. And this is the first place that we encounter the difference between kinetics and what we have already discussed and we'll discuss more, which is thermodynamics. Thermodynamics we'll discuss or talk about or we will learn about where a reaction is and where it will end up. Kinetics talks about how long it takes to get there. Uh, good. Surface area, one of my favorite videos. On the plate is a pile of lycopodium powder. If we aim a flame at it, not much happens. If, however, we take some of the lycopodium and then spray it into a flame, the combustion reaction is explosive. The more surface area of the lycopodium particles that is exposed to oxygen, the faster the reaction. Visual evidence, now let's discuss. So it doesn't matter what it is, lycopodium turns out to be a material with a lot of surface area, but it's still just a combustion reaction. Combustion reactions always go like this, <coughs> Take something, add oxygen to it, you get carbon dioxide, H2O, and maybe something else if there's chlorine and nitrogen in it. But what I want to talk about is in this example, you had solid in a pile with low surface area, and that will be represented by that cube. And then you have the powder that was broken up and thrown through the flame. And that's going to be represented by the same amount of material with more surface area. And so if you measure the distance around all these little tiny cubes, it has more surface area. But in the end, it's the same amount of stuff. That's what we're trying to, rep to represent. And what we will see is that reactions, when they occur, have to have, in general, a collision between the two reactants. And here, there is more area for collision, more surface area, or higher surface area, has higher reaction. Higher surface area has higher reaction. Any questions about those two? In the end, we are chemists, or at least you're in a chemistry class, which means you're all chemists this semester, and we will be interested in controlling how fast and slow reactions occur. These are two ways to do it. Yet another way. And room temperature bleach into separate beakers of colored water. We see that the hot bleach on the left destroys dye molecules more rapidly than the room temperature bleach on the right. Well, it's a pretty lame picture, but I mean, it's not an exciting difference. But hopefully, you saw that at higher temperature, the color faded more quickly, even though in the end, they will both end up at the same place. So, let me see what I want to say about this. Oh. As T, temperature increases, and here I will draw uh, an important distinction. Capital T, always temperature. Lowercase t, always time. So this is T, capital T for temperature. As temperature increases, reaction rate increases.
And at some point, we will be talking about this in more detail. However, from chemistry 400, we know at higher temperatures, there's higher average kinetic energy. Where my abbreviation, I've used the average AVG, kinetic energy, capital K, capital E, kinetic energy, and my abbreviation for average kinetic energy is K equal. And in fact, does anybody remember the, one of the equations we had last semester? Average kinetic energy is proportional to temperature. Sound familiar? It's always worth writing again. underlies everything we do. On the plate is a pot. And add a catalyst. Hydrogen peroxide in water decomposes slowly at room temperature. In the presence of manganese dioxide, however, the decomposition occurs much more rapidly. The reaction produces oxygen and water. The manganese dioxide is not consumed or otherwise altered by the reaction. It serves only as a catalyst and makes the reaction occur more rapidly. Have you ever purchased hydrogen peroxide? How long do they say to, to uh, keep it before you use it? Or how, what's the expiration date? Hmm, six months, maybe a year. After that point, your concentration will be noticeably lower. Still probably effective. But, um, and so, all we have to say about catalysts right now is that uh, add a catalyst, increase reaction rate. What we'll see is that if you can find a catalyst for a reaction, it will oftentimes increase the reaction rate many thousands, if not millions or billions of times. But again, more than that. And room? Now we know reaction rates. Now we move on to reaction rate laws. The rate law is a mathematical, mathematical relationship between the concentration of the reactants and the rate of the reaction. And so it is only concentration of reactants, again, because we're focusing on the uh, forward reaction. We will talk about reactions in which we look at initial rates so that we can focus on that. General reaction where little a and v are the coefficients, little x, and a is the chemical formula. C is the catalyst. And the catalyst, because it's not a reactant or a product, will typically be shown over the arrow if there is one. We haven't had too much experience with catalysts. But the general form of the uh, rate of reaction takes little k. This is little k. And as we will see, little k for a constant is chapter 14, kinetics. Big k, which will be equilibrium constants, is all the other chapters. That's why we make the distinction. Um, little k is the rate constant. a function of temperature. Big T, temperature. We will see, and this is thrilling to me, that little k can have almost any units. Oh, 
almost any units. And what I mean by that is that the units on, so don't most things in chemistry have one type of units and that's it. Even reaction rates only has a couple of types of units. But little k will be defined by whatever other amount of concentrations there are. So part of the problem will be when you solve for k, you will always have to keep track of your units and give them to me explicitly. Except that you always had to do that in my class. But this time, almost any units will come out. All right. Uh, let's see. I'm drawing to the little exponents here. Okay. And here's my second typo. The point I'm about to make is that these coefficients and these exponents are not necessarily the same. And so that's a hard point to make when they are the same. And so I'm going to change this to little m. This is going to be little n. And this is going to be little p. They're just other letters. And the point I'm going to make up here is that exponents are not necessarily coefficients. We will solve for the exponents. Exponents are not I think what I just wrote there is exponents are not necessarily coefficients. We will solve for the exponents. We will solve for exponents. And what we will typically see, so let's do a dot there and a dot there because this is the next point. Typically, exponents are 0, 1, 2, three or half. And they're sort of the equivalent of empirical formula type answers for um, CAM 400. I mean, they could be other numbers, but in the problems we solve, we'll keep it relatively simple. And they are typically, so uh, exponents can be zero, one, two, three, half, In problems you'll solve in Chem 401. Honestly, they can have other numbers. There are not that many other choices. You might imagine that there's a third or a quarter as well. Um, or, but anyway, if, if you have something other than this, I will tell you. <coughs> The other thing I will tell you is that in the kinetics lab, which is I think about the fourth lab that we do, your only answers will be 0, 1, and 2. Any questions about this stuff? Yeah. So basically Hydrogen peroxide. There we go. So basically those five exponents are like the only Those ones, so, so these ones will be the only ones you're going to get on problems. Um, if you get anything else, check with me. Or if it were on an exam, and I can't imagine this would be the case, but if it's on an exam, I will say, here's what the choices will be. Or the, the ex solve for whatever exponent is, right? I'll, I'll be obvious about it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Um, but I would say, at least 95, if not 99% of reaction rate laws do have only these numbers. So that seems like a reasonable limitation to make for chemistry. Any other questions? All right. reaction order. 
And for the example, for the example reaction I'm about to write, two dinitrogen pentoxide in the gas phase. Goes to four nitrogen dioxide plus oxygen. The experimentally determined rate law is Rate equals little k times the concentration of dinitrogen pentoxide. And all we want to say right now is that this exponent being 1 is different than this coefficient. Happens a significant part of the time. A significant part of the time, the coefficient and the exponent, they can be the same. They are the same sometimes too. All I want to say about this as far as reaction order, this rate law is first order in dinitrogen pentoxide. This rate law is first order in dinitrogen pentoxide. It is also first order overall. And for the overall part, all you need to do is add up all of the exponents. Add up all the exponents to get the order. So now we're going to go over determining the rate law using the method of initial rates. The data that I'm showing here should look familiar. We had data that looked just like this before. What's new is we have not one but two experiments and you'll notice that the initial concentration has changed. I've got your initial concentrations right here. And all I want you to notice from these two plots is that the slopes are different. And specifically, the initial slopes are different. Are we happy with that? Can we see that? Yes, thank you. So one of the things I do appreciate new students is when I, so when I ask you, I would love it if you guys, if you understood, would say yes or no. I, mean, I take a lot of feedback from you guys. And if you have a question, please, always stop. I've left blanks down here. And on the homework that you've got, the green sheet, you'll do this as well, except what you'll do is you'll actually calculate these initial rates using the first two points, right? That's the best we can do. And then put them into a table. And so the table will be the next problem. And it'll talk some. I'll just give you these two numbers. For experiment one, the slope is 2.2 times 10 to the minus fourth. That's molarity per minute. And here, the slope, the initial slope, the initial rate is 8.9 times 10 to the fourth. Or sorry, 10 to the minus fourth, 10 to the minus fourth. Those are both minus fourth. And this is an initial, so a, uh, the data that you need to determine the rate law using the method of initial rates. The general form of the rate law here
rate equals K times whatever this reactant is, NH4, NCO. Uh, to the A or to the M or to whatever the unknown exponent is. And it is the exponent that we are trying to determine. Yes, Bronson? Is that little K? That is little K, yes. Um, Can we make a cursor? Wait till you see my big Ks. Okay. <laughs> They're huge. Um, no, so, and as far as what I can say, I apologize, because I, I please do ask, but everything this chapter, um, until, like, at the very end, we'll see a big K, but everything is little K so far. Cursive little k's. Do people still know how to write cursive? I believe you. Um, no, no, if your question is do I know how to make yeah. them, that's a fair question too. Um, I'll tell you what, if it will help, <laughs> thank you. Would it help yes. if I use cursive k's? I will use cursive k's. And if I don't, remind me. Okay. Fair enough? Yeah. Um, big K's will not be cursive. Okay. Yeah. And by the way, so Esperanza was a student of mine last semester. Happy to do it. It's not in my notes, though, so I might make a couple mistakes. Anyway, if you have any questions, that's a simple thing to do. And it is much more obvious. OK, so now there's two ways to do it. We want to determine this. And we have two experiments. And uh, what I'll do is the next page should say calculations. Yeah. So we'll do all our calculations for this example on the next page. And we'll show you both ways to do it. Okay. So what you got to do is you got to take experiment. Yeah. I'm going to start with experiment one. And for experiment one, I'm going to write out the rate law. Rate equals this. Except now I know my rate. I don't know my K. And for experiment one, I know my initial concentration, but I don't know my exponent. So I'll just fill in everything I know. And then for experiment two, it's the same thing, just fill in the numbers. And I'm writing this directly under the other one on purpose, so that is key. I am then going to make it into a fraction, just so you know where I'm going. This is purposeful. So I'm going to make this into a, uh, a division problem. When I do that, so I will then divide these two numbers in a minute. Right now, oh, sorry, one step back. I have to put in my A's. I have to put in my A's. Now, my K's cancel out. K divided by K. Um, let's keep our A because that's what we're going to be solving for because now we have one equation and one unknown. If we take this division over here, we get 0 0.247. That's just 2.2 times 10 to the minus 4th over 8.9 times 10 to the minus 4th. We've divided those two. Divide these two, 0 0.5, to the A. Since they're both to the A, we can do the division and keep the A right there. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. Now, 
Now log both sides, logarithm, that's L-O-G, that is ten, base 10 logarithms. When you have an exponent and a logarithm, you can bring it down to the front, and we'll be able to solve for it. And there's nothing fancy to do over here other than to punch it into our calculator. If you punch it into your calculator, you get minus 0 0.607. Do log of 0.5, you get minus uh, minus 0 0.301. And solving for A, you get 2.02. Which rounds to two, that coefficient is two. Wow, that was a lot of math, just to find two as an answer. That's a good, good. Any questions about that? That's the long way, Logan, and then David. The math makes a lot of sense to me. I'm a little confused about the big picture. So, we have two different reactions with two different, well, it's the same reaction. Same reaction, good. Phase. Yep. So, and our Ks are the same. Yes. The temperature is the same. Yep. Right? I guess I'm, I'm having trouble understanding the setup and what the weight law actually tells me. Good question. Let me see if I can address that. So, um, so what the rate law is going to tell us, uh, let's see, let's backtrack. In order to, so this process allows us to know it. Now, and that's going to tell us the uh, rate law. And after this, we're going to do two things. One, if we know the rate law, we're actually going to go back and determine the integrated rate law and be able to construct this whole curve. So one of our goals is to use this data to know the concentration of our reactants and therefore products at any time. Very practical. The other thing, also practical but a little more abstract, is once we get this rate law, we're gonna start hypothesizing how the reaction occurs. And you cannot do that unless you know the rate law. So, I don't know if that, that's sort of the big picture. This rate law, let's say this. We will be able to hypothesize what happens on a molecular and atomic level that causes this reaction to occur based on the rate law. And in fact, the process is, is not at all static. What happens is you do the experiment, or the experiments in this case, you determine the rate law, you hypothesize a reaction mechanism, and then you go in and look to see how that reaction happens. That's amazing, by the way. They have lasers right now that can look at reaction mechanisms and, and actual collisions occurring on the femtosecond time frame which is fast enough that you can actually see if the, your hypothesis is correct or not. So, anyway, that's, is that a little bit more about the big picture? Yeah. David? So, since the co, or I guess the exponents aren't necessarily coefficients, mm -hmm. do they need units? Are there any units for the exponents? Oh, units for the exponents? Uh, no. Okay. So, good question. We always round you always round to the nearest whole number, and the whole numbers you can get are 0, 1, 2, 3, and half. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, when we were dividing, why didn't we, like, I know we were solving for the exponent, but generally aren't you supposed to cancel out like terms? So I'm just confused on like, why we didn't cancel out the A, I guess. Oh, why didn't we cancel out the A? Yeah. Um, let's see. I think, so that's a good question. My, um, my first answer would be, it, you, yeah, it's mathematically different that it's an exponent. Um, 
let's see. Right, so whereas this is k divided by k, this is both of these terms raised to a power. Oh, uh, okay. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. so the way that you reduce it or simplify it is by keeping the a there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Good question. I hadn't thought of that. James? Uh, if we got a equals like 0.6, should we make that a 1 or half? Great question. So, um, and this is where the relationship to empirical formula problems uh, kicks in. Um, so, first off, you shouldn't get that, right? Well, let's say this. In homework problems, <laughs> right? In preformed homework problems, you shouldn't get that, right? You shouldn't get 0.6 as an exponent. Um, just like in empirical formula problems, if you got a 0.6 somewhere, you're like, well, let me go look at my math. That's what you should do here. Now, you're going to do a kinetics experiment with actual data, your actual data. And your actual data may vary. Right? Your mileage may vary. So what we'll do for the lab, and it's lab, so we'll look at the data. In the kinetics lab, we actually generate a class set of data, which minimizes errors. And then we look at the class set, and I say, Yes, 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 no, yes, no. Because everybody leaves lab with a good set of data. So uh, if, you see, if you end up with a 0.6, uh, and as I was writing up my lecture notes and the problems, I got the, the, something like that. And it turned out that I transposed some numbers in when I wrote up the problem. So, so if you get a 0.6, definitely show it to me. Or anything, I mean, it, it, is, it is almost like this. If it's much farther than this, look at your math and check it before you come to me. Although I'm happy to check math too. Um, I would say the one situation that you might see that's a little different than that, I might make you do this three times and the average works out to the right number. So you might get 2.1, 1.9, 2.4, 2.04 and you have to average them. That's like the worst possible case I, I, you know, I can think of. But they do come out to small whole numbers or half. Any other questions? Good questions. All right, so then back on this page. That was the long way, and like so many things in chemistry, the long way always works. But maybe there's a shortcut. Wouldn't that be nice? And there is this time. And for the shortcut, uh, I guess I'll use, I'll use green, because I haven't used green yet. What do we notice between these two? This, this bottom number divided by the top number, what is that? It's perfectly two. And so whoever did these two experiments was like, I'm going to make my life as easy as possible. There's a factor of two there. And I'm actually doing the, um, let's see. So that's how I'm getting my factor of two. And so I got a factor of half here, but now I'm doing sort of the flip of this in shorthand notation. And they're raised to the x one in A. to the end. And then as long as you do these two in the same order, so we're going to do the 8.9 divided by the 2.2, you get something very close to 4. What is A? To make that a true statement, 2 to the A equals 4. A equals 2. So, short way of doing it works very nicely when the numbers are nice. Long way of doing it always works even when the numbers are not nice. And you can imagine that you will see a mix of problems to solve. Any questions about this? 
that seems like a very nice place to stop new material for today. Um, if you have any questions, I will be here until about 2 o'clock. <coughs> um, so I'll stick around a little bit. And then lab people can head over. If you have no questions, you can go now. Um, if you're, oh, afternoon people, if I could ask you really quick, sorry, la afternoon lab people. If I could ask you really quickly to come up and so I can take roll for you guys. And then I'll answer all your questions. <laughs>